Hi, good evening. My name is Srihari Naidu. I'm director of the Cath Lab Westchester Medical Center. It's my honor to chair this first of four webinars on behalf of Sky, um, Cath Lab Now, Navigating Today's Realities and Beyond webinar series. This is the first and four webinars we'll be doing almost every week for the next uh, four to five weeks. Uh, tonight, I'm joined with uh, Dr. Herb Aaron, who will be my co-moderator. I want to give you a little overview about what we're doing here with um, uh, the Cath Lab Now webinar. Uh, we have realized for the past year, really, obviously, we've been all living in almost an alternate universe with COVID. And it's been very clear that the pandemic has, uh, has triggered a bunch of strain points in the system. Cath labs, uh, the way they were run in the past, may have to change. We, we've learned that over the past six months. It's created a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interesting uh, dialogue about how to maintain an efficient environment, how to incorporate innovation, um, as well as how to, um, uh, how to address discrepancies in care. We've known for some time that in interventional cardiology, we've had uh, discrepancies and disparities of care that vary by geography um, and demographics. But we've also realized during the COVID epidemic that that was also hitting very close to home in some, uh, some groups more than others, some areas of the country more than others. And it became very clear that cath labs uh, and hospital systems need to address this better. So this series is meant to take a relook at cath labs and how they how they should be handled going forward and get some expertise in the room to have an open dialogue. The format will be three lectures, as I'll show you, um, but these lectures are really more almost orations where we basically hear from people to have an open dialogue about this and we'll just have a communication over the next hour. We welcome you to, to uh, come through the chat room and uh, give your questions and hopefully through the course of uh, this next hour, we'll answer some questions about how to move forward. The four different webinars, this first one is about efficiency and technology and innovation in the COVID and the pandemic era. The second one will be about disparities in care, as I just mentioned. The third will be about uh, wellness, both for our staff as well as uh, for patients um, and, how to, and how to keep people happy through this, this uh, difficult time um, where, where really the business and the uh, clinical aspects of uh, uh, cardiology still need to be at the forefront. And finally, the last webinar will be a kind of a healthcare executive roundtable to discuss everything we've learned uh, heretofore and to figure out how cath labs really play a role in healthcare systems um, going forward. Uh, next slide. So you'll see here we have Ajay Kirtan and Dan Simon, in addition to myself and uh, Herb Arano. Here are the three talks for tonight, cath lab logistics, uh, balanced elective, urgent and emergent um, cases across the spectrum of interventional procedures by Dr. Kirtan. Mechanisms to increase throughput and high quality efficiency, structural heart perspectives by Dan Simon. And finally, cost effectiveness strategies in the era of declining reimbursement, outpatient facilities and reduced pandemic related revenue by Dr. Allen. Uh, in terms of disclosures you see here, uh, this was uh, brought to us by an unrestricted educational grant from Medtronic. So we're very thankful for that support. In terms of ABIM, MOC, and CME, you can go to the website here. You see the link here to claim one M uh, MOC and CME point. Please make sure you do this by December 16th of this year. And here you go, the one and the one for the MOC. So with that, I'm going to hand over the reins uh, to Dr. Kirtanay to take us through that first topic. Well, thanks, Hari, and uh, really warm welcome to everybody who signed on. It's been somewhat of a tough time. Uh, I think everybody has somewhat Zoom fatigue, but at the same time, the fact that they've interest shows that this is an important topic and germane to a lot of people. Um, you know, I decided to do this without slides. The reason for that is that, you know, I can show basic slides, but I'm really gonna be talking more about philosophy um, of how we've done things in our cath lab. I'll use my own example or our own example at Columbia. For those that don't know me, I'm the director of the cath lab at Columbia uh, in New York City. Um, certainly there have been changing times even before COVID. Um, we actually sometimes forget that the cath lab and how we practice is always dynamic and things are always changing. What often happens is we get um, told that we're doing procedures, for instance, that we ought not to be doing and we ought not to even be taking patients to the cath lab. You'll recall about a year ago this time uh, at the AHA, the ischemia trial came out and this was starting to move even before COVID. Some would argue things didn't move enough and then COVID happened and then there were changes that many people thought would happen through ischemia that didn't happen through ischemia, but maybe happened through COVID. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So I think that we as interventional cardiologists feel that we are very apt um, and, and able to, uh, to counter uh, changes in our field, changes in what we do. Um, I've always felt that as an interventional cardiologist, 
it's easy for me because I can take care of patients outside the cath lab and patients inside the cath lab, whereas many of the people who sort of throw accusations and, and levy things at us only take care, care of patients outside the cath lab. So for us, we, being dynamic is part of what we do. Um, and I view that what's happened in the past year in some ways, as hard as it's been, as an opportunity to reassess where we are, to reassess um, what we'd like to do and how we'd like to change in terms of not only our own our own personal skills and, and uh, talents and, and attributes, but also how we take care of patients. Um, so yes, I do think this can be an opportunity and that's one of the reasons why I look forward uh, to participating in this webinar and certainly we'll be happy to entertain questions and, and comments from, from all of you uh, during the discussion period. So I think I just figured I'd take you through a little bit what happened with our lab right before COVID and then during COVID and then where we are right now. And this will sort of get to how we balance elective urgent and emergent cases uh, across our procedures. So basically, you know, we're a cath lab does around 2000 percutaneous interventions. We have a busy structural program, uh, endovascular program as well. Uh, we share rooms with EP. So we have seven cath labs and three EP labs. And um, it's kind of an, it's an open lab. We have a dominant group that's part of the university practice, but then there are also uh, outside physicians. We call them network physicians that uh, come in. And we have a somewhat unique system in that for specific types of cases, the higher risk cases, we will double scrub. So typically there'll be a staff person that's um, a senior uh, trained person in whatever uh, area that is, complex coronary, endovascular or structural. Um, and if we have an outside physician coming in, the two will double scrub together. And the idea behind that is to maintain a certain level of quality, irrespective of who the referring physician is and how the patient actually comes into our system. Um, in a sense, that's hard to do uh, with, with certain models of reimbursement and otherwise, but because all of us are salaried and we sort of use this group RVU or group productivity model, we're able to sort of um, balance where people are in specific ways. So why am I talking about that? Well, the reason is, is that it actually lends itself to a easier system of coverage when COVID sort of hit. And um, one of the things that we did because of exposure, and I think many of you are familiar with what we went through in the New York area, um, for those of you that don't know or don't believe or otherwise, I can assure you we were quite simply overrun um, at its peak. We were sort of 80 to 90% of the entire hospital COVID positive. Um, as many of you know, we expanded our uh, operating rooms to basically shut down all procedures except for the most emergent ones. And um, those operating rooms were converted to COVID ICUs. Our cath lab was converted to a COVID ICU where we basically had the holding area was a COVID ICU and the other part of the holding area never got used, but it basically became that. All of our nurses were deployed elsewhere. But this structure that we had of coverage allowed us to sort of deploy people in specific roles. So some of the most senior physicians who potentially would um, have most risks, particularly because PPE was scanned, um, basically stayed at home and they did triage. They did phone triage of, of, um, of certain cases. There were other folks who got deployed to the COVID ICUs and then we maintained a skeleton crew of people who were covering cases. But what was nice is because we had this sort of group model, there were not to my knowledge, at least, any arguments over who was going to do what and how we were going to deal with billing and all of that other stuff. It was mainly just sort of all the group coming together to try to sort this out. Now, one of the things that happened because of the pandemic and these extreme constraints on resources is that we really did not have the ability to do any elective case even urgent cases were being triaged. And I'll tell you, as the director, I personally, you know, this is very hard for me mentally because we had to, any case that had to come to the cath lab over like a two month period had to go through me. Um, I Inpatient, outpatient, we weren't taking transfers, but people at home with angina that was getting worse, I had to say, yes, we're gonna do it and we're gonna pull nurses from the unit in order to do this case. The challenging thing for that for me was that while I was really sensitive to the resources of what was happening with COVID, on the one hand, we know how to treat a patient with an urgent or even you know less urgent cardiac condition. In fact, we know that we can, if somebody's having an MI, save their life by treating them. On the other hand, the folks in the COVID ICUs or if nurses are left in the ICU, especially then all bets were off as to what would happen to that patient. And four hours away from taking care of that patient is not gonna necessarily change that patient's outcome. And so to then deny coming in for a cardiac condition was a real um, struggle. And uh, honestly, I think at times administratively for me, it was quite a challenge. But one of the things it did allow me to do, especially 
is to assess exactly what this paradigm of medical management might be like, um, the, you know, the ischemia trial management paradigm in some respects. And so I think we kind of changed what we thought was urgent um, to what's really urgent and maybe converged a little bit more on sort of European, Canadian or other models of that. Um, you know, in the New York area, if you have a positive stress test and a little bit of chest pain, um, for many patients with type A New York personalities, that is an urgent type of situation. But in reality, is that really urgent? Probably not. And so this is one of the things that we sort of learned through this. Um, you know, as the time went on, we started uh, bringing back cases, but it was really hard to get people to prioritize cases and to do it equitably across the system, um, especially across people in one group, people on the network side who were coming in and doing the cases. But I do think that we did evolve in what we thought was elective, urgent, and emergent um, over time. Juggling beyond that, the pre-testing logistics and all that, I'm not gonna really gonna go into that. Um, I will say that I know there's a separate webinar dedicated to staff morale. I will just mention that one of the concepts here of trying to determine what was necessary to go and what was not necessary to go was also dealing with the psyche of the individual physician. There are certain physicians in our group whose entire mind and existence mentally is defined by them as an interventional cardiologist. And you take somebody like that and you put them on the sidelines or you put them only in the COVID ICU and you have to deal with those issues of, um, and when if they say, I have a patient that needs to come, does the patient really need to come or is it because they feel like they have to do something totally le legitimately um, to sort of feel like they're contributing once again. And so those things also need to be negotiated um, over time. And so I'm glad there's a separate webinar uh, to talk about that. But I think ultimately over time, we all converged on sort of a different view of, what, of how to triage. We even converged on a different view of how to triage after we did the cath. Um, for instance, um, and I'm not advocating doing this for, for every site, uh, you have to have the requisite expertise to do it, but oftentimes for multivessel disease, for left main disease, um, in conjunction with the surgeons, we opted to do more PCI in some of those cases. Um, and similarly on the valvular disease side, I know Dan's gonna talk a little bit about this, um, we opted to do more percutaneous therapies simply because we did not have beds in the unit if the patient had to go to the OR and had to wait over there. So even the triage of how we did, did things evolved. And I think the final point I, I make is that our tolerance for complications also evolved. Um, it's really interesting that we had conversations among the CTO team and it was the, the, there was a reticence now to do really high risk sort of epicardial collateral type cases. And we, I remember sitting around in the cath lab and we were discussing this. And one of the reasons for it was there's so many people dying out there because of COVID and there's so much other stuff going on that a couple of our operators were like, you know, I can't bring myself to do a case and then have some random complication for somebody who has angina that only happens when they're walking around. I mean, it puts the whole way you think about medicine in some respects in a different perspective. And it was a really interesting conversation we had about it. Um, it's not to say we didn't do CTOs or anything like that once things settled down, but even our whole construct of what we were aiming to accomplish with taking somebody to the cath lab, doing coronary revascularization and the like changed. Similarly, our triage patterns changed. I do think that there was a, a differing um, use of more CTA, less stress testing, um, and just based upon how patients present, and we're still seeing that in, in, our, um, in our current cath lab. So what did I you know, hope to accomplish by going through this entire stream of consciousness type of thing without any slides? I think that what I, I, there are a few things. The first is that this entire situation that we've been dealing with the past six months have, has led to a lot of self-reflection, not only for me, but to a lot of my colleagues. And it was only through the exchange of these ideas that we sort of figured out what the best practice patterns ought to be for our patients, for our institution. I think it was dynamic over time. One of the things that you see if you get on Twitter or, or you look at um, the news or something is it's like lockdowns are great or lockdowns suck or one or the other. And remember, this is an entirely regionally dependent dynamic process. So when we were really bad in New York, there were other places that had no COVID. And then when we got much, much better, there were other places getting overrun. And similarly now it's the same thing. And I see too many people who are not adapting what is going on on a national level or international level to what's important in their local practice. So so remember, yeah, you have to be questions. dynamic. Maybe a couple of questions about, yeah. so you talked about when the hospital's overrun, but how about Herb and um, Dan, you know, hospitals that are kind of in the middle. So 
where the, uh, the, the prevalence of COVID is there, but you're not overrunning the ICU, you know, what kind of patients, how do you manage elective cases versus the urgent ones versus the emergencies? Obviously the emergencies need to be, all these patients have to be uh, tested for COVID to make sure that they're in a clean room. For example, at our institution, we have um, an area, a, a, one of the labs reserved for the unknown COVID population. Uh, and those patients all go in there with the same precautions that we had, uh, assuming they're COVID positive but then we keep staff available for the other uh, procedures now that the hospital is not overrun. During the height of the pandemic, we always kept one staff, one group in the cath lab for the emergencies and whatnot, and the other one, other staff were sent to the uh, different units. But then over time, we were able to pull more and more back to the cath lab and allow the normal processes to, to move forward. So any thoughts about how to balance all that and, and when to trigger uh, going back to the old model? I can share our personal experience uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. You know, I think the hardest part up front was not knowing, right? Um, we're watching what's going on with Ajay and all of his colleagues in New York, thinking that that's what's coming next and, and trying to prepare for that potential eventuality. We, we were very fortunate, right? We never got to the point where we had, uh, we were using the cat lab or the ORs as an ICU. We were ready to, we just never got to that point. But I think like a lot of centers, we halted electives we were only bringing in people that we felt were truly urgent uh, from, from the outside or emergent. And even the threshold for urgent, I think, was higher, right? I mean, it, it was really urgent. I mean, as we all know, unstable angina is sort of a wastebasket term, right? A lot of people get put into that category. But I think it's fair to say that we raised the bar. Um, to compensate for that, we pared back on how we staff the labs. So, um, and, and I mean, with respect to physicians as well. So, we pulled uh, one of our interventional fellows out of the lab so that we only had one in each of the two labs, essentially put them at home just in case. We were worried about, you know, what happens if the team starts breaking down because people start getting infected? Will we have enough people, enough of a core team to provide a, a life-saving service for that STEMI that comes in? And we did the same thing with the attendings too. We started to limit uh, how much time they would spend uh, in the hospital and, and altered our, our call schedules as well. We, you know, from an environmental standpoint, we changed the way the labs were set up too. So at each hospital, I, I, we have two, Miriam Hospital and Rhode Island Hospital, and both have equally busy cath labs, both uh, do STEMI and, and do a similar volume. And, and we have separate call teams for both hospitals on 24-7. Uh, and um, we designated labs for COVID and um, we actually kind of re-engineered things a little bit. We altered the pressure in the labs so that they were a little bit more uh, uh, positive in the sort of the control room than in the actual procedure area so that the air flowed into the procedure room a little bit. I know that sounds antithetical to what you'd want to do in a sterile procedure, but it, we didn't make it a truly negative pressure room, but at least if there was aerosolization or aerosol generation, we thought it would be safer. We, we walled off the control rooms from uh, in these designated quote unquote COVID labs from the, the main procedure area. Uh, and then kept any equipment we'd open in that outer or ante room, as we called it. And um, and then we'd have a runner, somebody who would hand equipment back and forth just so that there wasn't equipment open in the room and, and so that there wouldn't be contamination. So we, we had all these engineering controls that we put in place. And, you know, who would we use them in? Obviously, someone who was known COVID positive. But to be fair, we had very few of those where we knew ahead of time. Anyone coming in who we thought there was no way to establish um, whether they were a positive or, or negative. Somebody who came in emergently, a STEMI, et cetera. So those were some of the things that we did. I would say it was six to eight at most weeks that we were uh, in a reduced volume schedule doing only the most urgent cases. And then it was as if a, a, a switch flipped and we were willing to do everything. It took a little while for volumes to ramp back up again. I think not because we didn't have the access, but I think because patients were reluctant. And I know you've all seen this, right? Even people with STEMI and, and, and STEMI were reluctant to come in, unfortunately. I think people came in too late or sometimes not at all, but eventually uh, we got back to normal volumes and if anything, higher than normal volumes as we started trying to, to clean up from what had happened. And I'm sure we'll come back to it. I'll, I'll, I'll let Dan weigh in too, but you know, now here we are again, sort of at the beginning of another surge and, and trying to ask ourselves, you know, what did we do right? And what did we, we, we do wrong uh, last time? And you know, what, what should we do now as we head back in? But Dan didn't mean to monopolize. No, I mean, Ajay, I think one of the things that you mentioned, which I think is spot on is um, a switch um, to CTA uh, with heart flow for the assessment of coronary disease. I think that 
you know, we're all very familiar with NHS recommendations that really that's probably the go-to way to diagnose coronary disease now based on sensitivity, specificity, accuracy. And I do think if you think about the fact that in the US, 40% uh, of angiograms have no significant coronary artery disease and even patients with unstable angina, 20% don't have a significant stenosis. The use of, of CTA uh, with uh, you know four vessel, as we say, FFR is very valuable. And uh, in the beginning, when we were concerned about, for instance, aerosolizing during stress tests in that low PPE stage, CTAs became even more valuable. It also, I think IJ raises the question of, of real assessment of ischemia, as you were talking about the influence of the ischemia trial. Um, ischemia by nuclear uh, stress test or echo is uh, not nearly as accurate, I believe, uh, uh, compared to four vessel FFR with a CTA. So I think it, it's been very useful in helping us triage uh, disease. Um, especially uh, potentially in uh, patients uh, as, uh, with um, non-diagnostic temporal uh, troponin leaks, uh, possibly related to COVID as well. So I think very valuable and a, and a changing paradigm that I think will uh, um, um, last beyond the COVID era. So the other topic uh, we're going to get into your topic about efficiency, I guess taking a step back outside of COVID, back to the, you know, the regular flows of the cath lab, you know, in our lab, we try to balance, and it's a work in progress, balance the urgent electives and emergencies by maybe doing a couple of urgent patients early in the day, right before the labs, you know, the, the ambulatory patients are ready, then we start doing elective patients, and then we leave room, or we try to leave room and the availability of a lab for emergencies that come in that can be very disruptive. Um, how do you guys handle that? And then we can move into, or maybe Dan, you want to give us a talk on on the efficiencies in the lab, which also has to do with balancing these types of procedures. And then we can have a discussion about how different labs do this. Sure, happy to do that. Okay, well, really it's a, you know, a pleasure to uh, be here and to talk a little bit about our experiences with structural heart disease in increasing throughput and efficiency, uh, especially as, as uh, accelerated during the COVID time. I thought I would start with just a few brief slides, and just to, to state that um, uh, Ohio had really modest surges uh, in April and in July, but right now is in the midst of a very significant um, uh, significant surge. And the question that you know came up, our governor uh, stopped um, elective procedures on March 17th and then didn't re um, uh, open them up again until May 8th, although one of his criteria did include progression of disease uh, and significant quality of life, as well as life-threatening conditions, which certainly from the aortic uh, stenosis space, uh, we were allowed to proceed uh, during that time. One of the, you know, I think surprising things, you know, we're, we're a um, 18 hospital system in Northeast Ohio. We do uh, 20,000 uh, casts uh, across these hospitals. And in 2019, 450 structural interventions, predominantly uh, in the academic medical center uh, uh, overall, except for left atrial appendage closures. And one of the really interesting things through uh, 2020 and the pandemic is we've actually seen a growth in our structural heart cases, about a 15% growth in Watchman, about a 15% growth in MitraClip, and even a 5% growth um, in TAVR. And what the example that I wanted to use to you as one that I think really gets at this issue of efficiency and safety is uh, shown for you on the next slide. And that really relates uh, to, if you could have that, yes, is um, the use of uh, CTA and ICE deployment strategies for left atrial appendage closure that leads to same day discharge uh, for uh, left atrial appendage closure in nearly 70% of patients. So this is, uh, was adapted especially to the COVID era because it's uh, the same day CTA and pre-procedural planning as the ICE-based deployment strategy and then the patient goes home. So we really try to limit the visits to the hospital uh, for this procedure. And here you see CTA pre-planning. Uh, we use a very similar uh, perimeter and area measurements uh, for um, uh, the left atrial appendage. And uh, using the next uh, generation flex device allow for about a 10 to 30% compression or oversizing, as you would say, uh, of the device. This is a, a typical um, ice mitral inflow view, uh, which shows very nicely the anatomy uh, 
um, of the um, appendix. Now, what's uh, I think really good to show here is that um, this uh, program uh, can be accomplished with just really tremendous success and uh, safety. And as you see in our experience in uh, 2020, uh, we went from about 1.2 devices uh, per case, uh, now down to really uh, one device per case with a procedural success rate, uh, which is you know really uh, quite high. I think that we like to say that the comparison uh, between um, uh, CT-based sizing and use of ice is sort of similar to the change in uh, TAVR procedures that were done uh, with TEE and without CT guidance. So we're obviously a per conscious sedation TAVR lab, which is all CT-based uh, with just transthoracic echo. But I think the new device uh, and confidence in this procedure now allows us to discharge about 70% of patients the same day. If you go to the next slide, although it's a little bit busy, we can certainly um, have this uh, sent out to those is the algorithm that Dr. Steve Philby and Dr. Haram Bazira put together related to what are the criteria for same day discharge. And interesting, the most important uh, criteria now is whether the patient has somebody to go home with. Uh, they can't go home alone. And uh, we do have uh, scenarios where there is really no one uh, to stay with the patient. And uh, that's probably the biggest indication. So 60 to 70% uh, come in for now same day imaging uh, and procedure. And this really you know, takes me to the wider um, uh, discussion of you know, how did this actually evolve and develop? And you know, the interesting uh, thing is that um, as I'm sure uh, with Ajay and many of his uh, partners at Columbia, we started doing TAVR in Europe long before um, well, we did them in the United States. We have uh, sister cath labs, both in Sicily uh, and in Porto in Portugal, and uh, traveled uh, to Portugal in 2008 and 2009 to start doing a TAVR there. And one of the very interesting things that we saw way back then in 2009, nearly 11 years ago, were because of uh, strain on national health resources uh, in Portugal, that procedures were being done with per conscious sedation in the cath lab all the way back in uh, 2009. And we took that um, uh, to our hospital uh, here um, really as soon as we could uh, uh, after a trial started to really move into a per conscious sedation uh, mode. So uh, we have certainly published our experience uh, we do not do cases uh, in hybrid operating rooms. They're done in routine cath labs. Three to four are scheduled per room, you know, per day uh, in a regular cath lab setting. And I think one of the, the very, um, you know, embarrassing things for me sometimes is I'm doing a complex uh, PCI and uh, the team next door uh, completely finishes a tavern uh, well before, uh, you know, I'm done. And so I think they're very, very efficient procedures. One big change for us to really get into this issue of merging imaging and structural disease together so that you can do a same day um, a CT uh, and um, uh, appendage closure is we actually constructed a room. We call it a hybrid cath lab. It does, it does have the ability. It is completely OR compatible uh, for, for instance, transapical mitral of valve procedures and things is to have a cath lab that's actually embedded uh, into an imaging center. And we have an advanced structural center where we have cardiac MR and CT and cath lab all next to each other. So patients who are coming to the structural heart disease team are coming to a place where imaging cardiologists and, and, and interventional uh, cardiologists work together. Patients are going to the same clinic for their imaging as well as their procedure. So it becomes very, very efficient on the first visit to also undergoing imaging, even in the non-COVID era to make these procedures uh, very efficient. Um, now we made the similar adaptations as I'm sure all of you did uh, during the COVID area. We did TAVRs through, you know, in symptomatic patients through this essential procedure uh, time period, um, but we really try to keep them out of intensive care units. These uh, people were recovered and sent to, you know, uh, step down floors uh, for their care. So hopefully, you know, in this really brief review, you can see uh, from leveraging the power of advanced imaging, CT-based imaging of the appendage, instead of using general anesthesia and transesophageal echo to do same-day appendage closures and discharge um, 
really enhancing efficiency of the lab and can be extended now to the almost the vast majority of our TAVR patients who are discharged uh, the next day. We have not uh, advanced um, as operators in Canada to same day discharge uh, for TAVR would be interesting to hear uh, if any of you are, are doing that. So I think, you know, one of the common themes here is to try to find ways uh, to get patients to the hospital quickly. So we talk about the coronary space, we can talk about the big push to do more radials to avoid complications and obviously same day discharge. So question for Ajay and her, what percent of uh, PCRs are going, going home the same day now? Was that expedited or pushed through quicker in the COVID era? You know, for us, we, we were doing a fair amount of same day um, anyway. So for us, this kind of just um, I guess made that even greater. I can't recall during that period of time whether there were any patients that we did that were urgent that actually stayed in house. We really tried to get everybody out um, and had good good results with it. So um, I think it's good and it increases the impetus to do that across the board, which is I think good for patients who have who live close enough that they can actually do that. Yeah, so we have a protocol that are obviously clinical factors, nursing has to sign off that the patient is educated and understands you know, what could happen if they go home in terms of what to look out for and to come back. And of course, if patients are very far away, we're somewhat more reluctant, um, but we have a protocol. So people, are, uh, the attendees who need something like that, especially if you have smaller community hospitals, we're happy to share those things uh, with you to try to get patients in and out of the hospital quickly and avoid the COVID, uh, COVID areas in the hospital. Herb, what have you guys been doing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the percentage of overall cases that end up being same day discharge is going to depend a little bit on your percentage of electives. That you know, we, we have a fairly high volume of um, TCS, but I'd say um, almost all of our electives go home same day. I mean, if you had a, a supported PCI and mechanical circulatory support device, you're not going home. But even uncomplicated um, atherectomy and other procedures, uh, whether it's uh, from the wrist, which we're about 75%, or from the groin. You're likely to go home the same day unless you know somehow you ended up on the table later in the day and it's just a little bit too late to go home so we were there before the pandemic so that the pandemic probably didn't change that much for us for us it probably did push us more because we were probably a little more conservative in the hospital and so during the pandemic definitely uh, there was a bigger push to uh to use the protocol that we had to get patients to meet criteria and get patients out, out of the hospital more. For the structural yeah. stuff, I do think that, you know, we were using the ICUs more for TAVRs and as the risk has come down, we've been making more of a push to A, use the cath lab, the microclips and whatnot, because our, our throughput is much quicker in the cath lab than in the OR. <clears throat> we have more direct control over the rooms. Um, and number two, uh, obviously the patients are lower risk. So uh, what have you guys been doing at Columbia or Brown? You know, it's interesting. I just uh, say that we put most of our patients after TAVR in our step-down unit. So we were doing that beforehand, uh, but we don't do TAVR in the cath lab. They're all done in the hybrid OR. And, and, and so the issue we ran into during the pandemic was that the bar uh, was set very high for doing cases in the OR, you know, it was your trauma and, um, you know, really your true emergencies. And people started to call into question leadership in the OR, you know, how can you do a TAVR? Uh, you know, isn't that elective? And you know, we sort of, we tried to argue the mortality rate of waiting for that TAVR because it's real. Um, but there was a tremendous amount of pushback. We ended up um, putting most TAVR on hold during um, that six to eight week uh, period of time. I'm curious to know what, what others did. You know, we would do the one set of patients that actually can die if they don't get treated or actually severe AS. So we ended up doing TAVRs, but they were selective. Um, and uh, we did use a combination of the cath lab and, and the OR, but with some cath lab nurses up there. What was interesting in terms of the recovery, though, is that we've traditionally recovered many of these TAVRs. Um, they're the high risk ones in the unit. We do have some protocols for other places to, for them to go. But then when the volumes came down, what ended up happening is we needed to maintain capacity in our units because you didn't want to run unit beds empty because you were staffed to run in the units. So we actually uh, maintained our presence in the unit with these post taver patients, much to our, our chagrin initially, but when it was explained to us how this is working and how you would have to, and people staffing would have to be dramatically impacted, we then understood and then kept doing it. Dan's nodding his head. So it sounds like, you know, these yeah, no, I, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, IJ, one, one of the things that I would, you know, point out about doing TAVR in operating rooms is you can't do four TAVRs and go home at five o'clock. And you can do four TAVRs and go home at five o'clock in a cath lab exactly because you completely control the room. 
and that was the the greatest impetus. It's much cheaper. You know, we certainly have shown that you save anywhere from ten to sixteen plus thousand dollars in that move uh, because you don't pay PACU fees, uh, you don't pay anesthesia fees. Our our nurses are doing conscious sedation without anesthesiologists. It's a it's a tremendous uh, resource saving, and um, you know we certainly run a um, uh, a visitation course at our hospital for Medtronic. Uh, in pre-COVID, we're having one to two hospitals uh, come by a month to try to to take their teams of anesthesiologists, surgeons, and interventionalists who who have been traditionally in the operating room with heavy resource, uh, you know, investment into these much more, as we call minimalist and ultra minimalist environments. And it's uh, everybody who comes says they'll never go back uh, once they, uh, they see the lab and then they go home and they do this. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to change your comfort level, but after that, there's no going back. So Herb, why don't you take us through the third talk and then we can, we have about 10 minutes at the end, we can go through some of these other topics in more detail. Thanks, Harry. I want to thank Sky for the opportunity to, to speak tonight and Medtronic for, uh, for supporting this. So I'm going to speak a little bit about um, how to be cost effective uh, overall, but, but also uh, particularly during the pandemic. Before I dive in, I, I just want to make the point that when you, when you do economic analyses, um, your conclusions are going to depend entirely on the perspective that you take. And so when we talk about being cost effective or cost efficient, we're really talking about from a hospital uh, perspective. So you might come to totally different conclusions if you were looking at this from the perspective of society or the payer or even a patient, right? It just depends who's, who's paying that bill in the end. So obviously the conversation we're about to have is from a, a hospital uh, perspective. Uh, there's a great document, if you haven't seen it, um, and kudos to Jim Blankenship and his colleagues who put together the Sky ACVP expert consensus statement on cardiovascular cath lab economics. Um, it's cited at the bottom. We'll be sure to put it in the resource center for you. Uh, I'm only going to skim the surface of what it covers, but if you want to get a little more granular, and I, I'd encourage you to do so because I think it really dummies this down, and I can tell you it was helpful for me without a background in economics. So. Um, I, I want to start out by uh, making a first point that in the current payment climate, um, that your success financially, that is your, your, your viability, requires that um, you as physicians and your cath lab managers are optimizing your outcomes, um, optimizing efficiency of care, and that you're aligning um, everyone on this team uh, with, with a common strategy. Um, that you have agreed upon processes and that, um, and that you take into account the local culture in which you're operating. Um, the uh, operating margin or your profitability is going to require two things, right? Um, this is pretty simple. You need to maximize revenue. You need to minimize expense. And so when it comes to minimizing expense, that means you need to be efficient. You need to start on time. You need to turn around quickly. You need smooth day-to-day -day schedules. You need to get your materials um, for the most reasonable cost you can. Um, when it comes to maximizing revenue, on the other hand, um, it's going to come down to things like making sure that everyone's documenting appropriately and thoroughly and that uh, everything's being coded appropriately. Coding for not just what procedure you're doing, but the comorbidities, uh, how complex um, uh, are, are, you know, are, are the medical comorbidities of that particular uh, patient and, and were there complications? Because as we all know, complications are going to uh, factor in and drive a significant amount of cost. And in a fee for service or a bundled payment system, most of us or many of us practice in those systems. Uh, obviously, higher volumes will translate into higher revenues. In a capitated system, that may not be true. So I want to speak for a moment about expense reduction, and I'll, I'll touch on, in general, uh, what we always need to be thinking about, and then uh, just some thoughts for the pandemic, and, and, and I'll pause and maybe ask others uh, on the panel for, for their thoughts about what they've done during the pandemic. Uh, we always want to get lower cost supplies. Um, we want the best price, but we also want the best value. And um, the best price is a little bit tough. Uh, most of the time that occurs through participation in, in group purchasing organizations, and that's sort of beyond or above the level of a cath lab a director or manager. Uh, but your hospital likely is participating in one, and that certainly will help you uh, 
Um, but there might also be, if you, for example, you know, Dan, you mentioned you have 18 uh, hospitals in your system. We have two uh, that have cath labs in ours. So certainly by having multiple labs that are vying for the same products, um, you, you may be able to negotiate uh, lower prices. When I say best value, uh, what I mean is that um, it's worth taking a very close look at, at the equipment you're using. You know, you might be spending fifty dollars for a radial artery sheath, or a hundred dollars for the, you know, the the next highest version of that uh, sheath, the turbo, if you will. Is it worth it? Is it worth doing that on every case? And so you need to ask yourself questions like that if you're going to reduce expenses. You need to avoid unnecessary costs. And so. We've already talked a little bit about same-day discharge. Uh, you're going to get reimbursed the same amount of money, whether they stay overnight or not, for the most part. So sending them home same day, if that's the right thing for the patient, certainly is the right thing from an economic standpoint for the hospital. Uh, for patients who are staying in the hospital a little bit longer, uh, hospitalized inpatients, that is, uh, don't order things that you don't need to order during that admission. Uh, if there are that patients going to have a tavern down the line and you figure, well, they're here, I'll just get the CTA. Uh, that's just going to eat into the DRG. So that's a cost that's necessary eventually, but it doesn't have to occur during that particular episode of care. And then uh, it's worth emphasizing that uh, optimizing outcomes uh, is always going to reduce costs. So transradial PCI is going to minimize bleeding. Having a quality improvement program um, is going to translate into lower costs as well, because complications add significant costs to your hospital stay. Uh, making sure that you have M&M &M and that you do random case review. All of those interventions, ultimately, it's hard to measure, but ultimately will translate into lower costs. What about during a pandemic? Um, well, here it's a little bit hard to reduce uh, your costs because uh, many of them are fixed. Um, I can tell you that in our hospital and many others, um, staff and uh, some physicians were redeployed to right-size ourselves to the lower volumes that were coming through the cath lab. Uh, there were costs of PPE, and many hospitals struggled with this, but we found ourselves using PPE for uh, longer periods of time than uh, we had anticipated, in particular some of the respirators. And so there are, uh, there are opportunities for cost savings there as well. I mentioned the cath lab setup that we had, the environmental controls that we put in place where we had an ante room where we kept all the procedure. That was to protect the situation where we would expose a, a large volume of expensive equipment to a virus without the ability to, to potentially clean it or without the room going down for days while we waited for that risk to mitigate. Um, Non-emergent cases, uh, oftentimes we uh, will push those off if they come in on a Saturday till Monday. Uh, but um, during the pandemic, we, we felt like we just needed to do everything we could to continue moving forward to decompress the hospital. Um, and certainly doing so was gonna reduce the expenses for those particular hospitalizations. And then most of what I've just spoken about is about operational costs. Um, but don't forget about uh, capital, right? Every year you think about what you really need. You need another cath lab, a million and a half dollars, $2 million, whatever it's gonna cost to put that in. This is a time to think about how long can you really live without something because obviously revenues are down. So let's talk about revenue and optimizing revenue. Talk about always, and then we'll talk about during a pandemic. I mentioned earlier, documenting and coding is, is key. You need that feedback loop. So whoever's doing the coding and the billing needs to be uh, sending feedback to the providers who are doing it so that we can all improve. Random audits are one way to make sure we're doing that as best as we can. Um, Claims need to be submitted and resubmitted in a timely fashion. That means physicians need to sign their procedure reports on time. If, if that's a problem in your lab, then, then you need to reel that in because that can come back to bite you as well. You need to optimize efficiency. Uh, and, and by doing so, by having on-time starts and shorter turnaround times, certainly you'll be able to do more cases during a day, at least during non-pandemic times. Um, and then expansion of services is another way to optimize revenue. There may be new procedures you're not doing yet. There may be market that's untapped. During a pandemic, it's a little bit harder. Uh, certainly, if there are people in the hospital who have uh, an indication for catheterization uh, and possibly revascularization, but it's not urgent, it is probably best for the patient to let them get out of the hospital, certainly uh, by not doing a procedure that doesn't have to be done at that time that optimizes the revenue that's coming in for that stay. Um, if patients have urgent and emergent conditions, and, and the reason to do this isn't to optimize revenue, but 
the reason to do this is from a public health standpoint. We've all, as I mentioned before, seen that stroke and MI and uh, even critical limb ischemia didn't come into the hospital when it should have during the pandemic out of fear. So encouraging our patients who really need our care to come in certainly will bring more volume to cath labs as well, appropriate volume, mind you. Uh, and then finally, and with a question mark, advocate for stimulus dollars. I, you know, most of these decisions are made at a much higher level than the cath lab, and certainly hospitals, many benefited from uh, federal monies. Um, whether those trickle down to the cath lab, um, uh, I, I think is probably a very, a very local decision. So let me wrap up. I would uh, say the following. Uh, that cost effectiveness is essential to assuring your viability as a cath lab. The cath lab leadership has to remain nimble with respect to threats and opportunities. Uh, and certainly the COVID-19 pandemic represents a threat. We need both peacetime and wartime strategies. Uh, some of the things we do on a day-to-day -day basis during non-pandemic times, those things won't be applicable during a pandemic and vice versa. Um, it's a team, uh, and so we can't do this in a silo, and, and, and dyad partnerships are essential to our success, especially during trying times like these. And I think networking with colleagues, whether it's through a webinar like tonight or otherwise, just to find out what everybody else is doing, what, what best practices are out there for optimizing um, uh, revenue or for minimizing costs. So thanks, and uh, we'll welcome your thoughts. Yeah, I think you uh, make some very, very good points. I think when I listened to your talk, <clears throat> I had the impression really that for many years as a cap lab director, it was always that we're trying to get the interventional cardiologist to kind of play ball in terms of the economics of it. Um, and I think in this era, we realized, you know, in order to innovate and to bring in new technologies and to do the things that interventional cardiologists want to do to move the field forward, we have to be better partners with the hospital. That means we have to participate in keeping the length of stay down. We have to participate in not doing unnecessary uh, tests and procedures in the hospital uh, that eat into a DRG, because if we can't, if a hospital cannot be viable and have a, a good profit margin for the cath lab in particular, then we can't get more equipment back to the lab. You want to put IBIS in all the rooms, you want to put you know, you want to put FFR everywhere. We already have that, but CT, FFR, for example, with all these things in, you have to be good stewards of the cash flow uh, of the hospital so they will reinvest in us. And I think the, the uh, quality aspect is a big one, which is that we always thought of quality as something that, you know, is a negative word, right? We don't want to deal with the quality aspects, but the truth is nothing drives up, um, uh, drives up costs and complications of procedures that expand length of stay and, 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 uh, and require additional procedures to solve that. So. I think it does uh, open up that whole discussion that interventionists really have to get together with their director um, to make sure that the lab is doing its part to, to maintain the revenue stream. Thoughts Herb, you know, Jay? Yeah, the, I have a, just an interesting thing to add, and that is that your, your concept of high reliability medicine and variation as a, a problem in, in excessive cost is really important. We, we published a, a really interesting article in CCI in November or so of 2016. The first author is Asher, last name. And it was called The Shopping Trial. And what we did is uh, we took 10 operators and took 10 single stent lesions. And we reported all of their direct, uh, direct costs. And we did it in identifying the operator as well. And then the intervention was to say how much everything cost every time the operator wanted something in the cath lab. So if you'd open a wire, they would say $20. You'd open a different wire, they'd say $1,000. Every sheet, every guide, everything that you did. And we were able to show both the effect of peer pressure and the fact that you found out you were a high cost operator, and then you understood the cost of the devices that you were using. We were able to cut the cost per case and direct costs of by $234. Now that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but these were simple, simple cases. And so, you know, for you, Ajay, who were saying that you do 2000 interventions a year, you're talking about a minimum of saving $460,000 from just saying how much something costs and what the peer pressures of knowing where you are on that scale. And obviously the costs skyrocket when you start doing more complex procedures and you're taking out even more stuff. So there's no question that variability costs money and that you can, you can drive decreased variability in the lab by publishing the direct costs of all your partners. Yeah, I think we, you know, as a community probably don't do a good enough job with that. Most of us have 
very little insight into what everything costs that we do. Um, but every time someone does mention it, I know it, it changes my behavior, it changes my colleagues' behavior. Um, I made that point earlier about the sheets, and that was a, a real example where you might not realize that the choice between one sheath and the other sheath is $50. And when you're doing thousands of procedures a year, that's going to add up. Well, what we've done, uh, we haven't had to do it at the current hospital, but where I was before, we did um, it anonymously, Dan, in the way you mentioned, we took all the operators, gave them a letter A, B, C, D, E. They don't know which, they know what letter they are, but nobody else knows what letter they are. And we just basically did a variety of things, cost per case. We've also done things like door to balloon time per operator. And we don't have to talk much about it. Everybody knows what number they are. We don't know, we don't know what letter they are. Nobody else knows what letter they are. But if they're an outlier, you wait one more month later and that outlier becomes, um, you don't even have to talk to them, it just happens. And it's not that it's peer pressure necessarily, but it's just that you're showing that their outcomes are the same and one has one or two have very high cost relative to the other, clearly they could be doing at a better cost effectiveness ratio and just showing them that makes a difference. I'm not advocating that all has to be done in labs, but when you do have outliers, that's one way to do it anonymously without sort of putting a start letter on that person. Ajay, any other? Uh, tips and tricks for efficiency and cost reduction that you've seen? No, I, I'm in support of all of those things in partnership with the administration too. But one of the things that I do think is important um, on the physician side is to really emphasize and re-emphasize and re-emphasize to administration um, the fact that the patient care aspects of what we do um, are not always measurable in this way. And that what a lot of institutions are set up to do is all the slack gets picked up by the providers or the physicians. If there's a late case or there's something, they know we're gonna stay because we stay. And all the other resources and that sort of thing gets dealt with in a much more dollars and cents way. And so the understanding that we do that because we feel like that's something important for our patients, but yet the communication to administration that, hey, we know we're gonna do this and you know, we know you know we're gonna do this, but we can't be walked over is really critically important. And I think it speaks to some of the comments we've seen in the chat about staff retiring and the staff issues and all of that, because um, it's very tough for them as well. But I still think that, I mean, we have an amazing staff, but I can tell you that at the end of the day, when it comes time to really staying beyond time and that sort of thing, we work in a unionized environment. It's the docs that often will end up staying well past any prescribed times or anything like that. And I actually know the nurses and, and staff would want to stay, but they have restrictions that, that prevent them from doing that sometimes. Well, that's a good point. I think we'll talk about that in the third uh, webinar, but uh, I think when we talk about wellness, a lot of it resolves around staff. But I do think we should talk about the physicians because I think the, the time has come where we do have to advocate for ourselves as well um, in terms of what we're able to do in, in, in a very safe uh, and fair and balanced way when the whole system is stretched. So let, maybe we can talk about that uh, in the third webinar. You know, I just wanted to just say one thing because not all hospital administrators are bad guys. I'm, I'm the uh, president of the Academic Medical Center and the chief clinical officer uh, for the whole health system. And so it's nice actually to have a practicing interventional cardiologist up there because I think clinical leaders uh, do understand these issues. And I think um, you're right that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the drive for efficiency and technical revenue um, does leave the patient out. Uh, but I'm hopeful, uh, Ajay and Herb and, and Hari, that you have uh, hospitals where you do have physician leaders who can be supportive of you as well. We do. And we, our, our leaders are all physicians. And I can't tell you the difference that makes, um, uh, at least to our existence. So I want to switch gears a little bit. We have a couple of minutes about innovation. So has any lab been able to innovate during this time period? Or are we only innovating in areas that could, that could advance cost effectiveness strategies? What do you, what, what's going on? Are we going to, this COVID may not be going away for a while. We still need to innovate in the cath lab uh, and move, move the field forward, which ultimately pays dividends and rewards down the line in terms of cost. So how are we advocating for those things? You know, we were able to bring research back and uh, we did it in, in ways that were um, 
you know, somewhat, I don't know if they're innovative, but they're shared among other institutions. We've engaged with the FDA. There's actually a think tank later in this uh, in December to talk about the issues with research and what happened um, with, with research protocols. And do you have to stop early? Do you have to use different statistical methods? What do you have to do in order to get things working? And, and, and telehealth was clearly an innovation shared across um, every institution in the United States, if not the world. And how you incorporate those visits into your standard routine um, is something that I think there's shared experience starting to develop. So I, I do feel that innovation still occurred. And as I started my first talk with, I felt like almost in some ways this was an opportunity. Um, telehealth was a good idea, but languishing forever. And the pandemic just jump started it and moved it forward. Same thing with remote blood pressure monitoring and a whole bunch of other things that can be done. All right, Barb, you want to wrap us up? I think we're nearing the end of the hour. I don't see any more of the, I think I have tried to answer a bunch of the chat questions. Um, here's one question. Uh, do any of you have any cath lab cost reduction incentives as part of the quality portion of your compensation? We do not. Um, it's an interesting motivator, right? Um, and it probably would be very effective, but uh, we're just not uh, in that model right now. How about everybody else? No, not currently. I mean, uh, directors around the country have sometimes done things like that, where if they can show either volume growth or revenue, uh, revenue growth, and they can get a proportion based on uh, cost reduction strategies, a proportion back to the cath lab. That's something you need to negotiate, negotiate with your senior administration. It does make sense. So for example, if you can say you can spare every $10 you save, $2 comes back to the cath lab for as we see fit in terms of innovation and our research. I think that's a reasonable proposition, but uh, I'm not sure. Dan, you're sort of in healthcare leadership. Would that, would that be something that would make sense to you? Well, we certainly, you know, have quality uh, and patient experience, especially incentives, but they tend not to be um, as granular to uh, a specific area like that. But um, um, I would say that um, there's certainly um, an openness now especially in the value-based space of quality and experience divided by cost uh, to return dollars uh, for research and education, for sure. And I think that um, we do have some programs like that and, and that does make good sense. All right, Herb, you wanna wrap us up? Absolutely, well, this has been a, a great hour. Uh, it was, uh, I learned a lot from all of you and I enjoyed the dialogue and the questions. Um, we had a chance to talk about balancing urgence and and um, and electives uh, during a pandemic something unfortunately we're going to have to do again we learned a lot about throughput and efficiencies and a little bit about economics as well hopefully there were some lessons learned in there for everybody um, i know for me again there were um, i want to thank sky for helping uh, to put this together i want to thank medtronic for supporting the activity and i want to thank all of you for being here